Comrades, I have to tell you about a very interesting dream I had. I was in space in front of the moon and it was all three of us and we were taking a selfie. A selfie with the moon. But then I realized it was actually not just the moon but the far side, the dark side of the moon. And so I had a brilliant idea when I woke up. Let's make a probe and take some photos of the far side of the moon. That will show those Americans, right? You know, Comrade Jebediah, that is not a bad idea. Let's actually do it. Glory to the Soviet Union and welcome to What The Math. And welcome back to learning history of space program through Kerbal Space Program. This is episode 11 and we're talking about the Soviet mission called Luna 3 that was actually launched on the 4th October of 1959. This was only about two months after the Explorer 6 mission that was able to snap a shot of the first picture of Earth from space. So we can probably imagine that the Soviets were furious. They probably thought, hey, why didn't we think about this? This was a great idea, so we should probably launch something too. And so using their Vostok rocket, which was actually the rocket that hasn't really changed that much from the original launch of Sputnik 1, Basically, it was uh, still the same launch platform and still the same first and second stage, but it did have a slightly more complex upper stage. And it was really the same rocket that launched Luna 1 and Luna 2 as well. And so using this rocket, the Soviets decided they're going to launch their own mobile flying camera, but takes a picture that was actually relatively difficult to achieve. They've decided they wanted to take a picture of the far side of the moon. That's right. Not just the picture of the moon, because obviously you can see that from the sky, but the far side of the moon, the side that we actually we never get to see because the moon is tidally locked with our planet so there's a side that we never get to see unfortunately and obviously there's quite a lot of mysteries about that dark side of the moon some people thought maybe there's some alien life forms living there maybe there is some sort of secret base from the soviets or from the united states but obviously the soviets wanted to just kind of take a picture and to see what it actually looked like and the dark side of the moon is actually famous for several things one of them is that it has one of the largest craters in the solar system with a diameter of approximately 3,000 kilometers or 2,000 miles and that particular crater is called Oceanus Procellarum and its surface is actually quite different from the surface that we see from our planet so the dark side of the moon is actually uh, covered in various impact craters and has almost no flat areas unlike the side that we see from earth but what's interesting is that because this side never gets to really see the earth it's also shielded from all kinds of electromagnetic communication from our planet so some scientists have actually suggested that we could possibly install a radio telescope on the dark side of the moon and it would actually be shielded from all kinds of interference from our planet because it will be obviously on the other side of the moon. But this is possibly a mission that we could try to do in the future in one of the future Kerbal Space Program videos. But for now, let's just focus on this. And so this was actually the third space probe to be sent in the neighborhood of the moon. And although it snapped quite a lot of pictures, only 18 of them were able to be used when it actually returned to the planet. And obviously the quality of the pictures wasn't super stellar. This wasn't your digital photography. But using all kinds of analyses, uh, the Soviets were able to distinguish quite a lot of parts on the moon or, and even start naming some of them. And not surprisingly, a lot of the areas on the far side of the moon actually have somewhat Russian names. Like, for example, there is a low-lying region called Mare Moscoviense, which is basically Sea of Moscow, obviously named after Moscow. But they also found quite a lot of various mountains. They found quite a lot of really interesting um, meteorite impacts. And all of this was distinguishable from the pictures that they actually took. But let's actually just start with the beginning of the mission. So this mission was launched over the North Pole. So it had a polar orbit, which is what I'm recreating here. So we didn't really go east or west here. We went directly over the North Pole. And unfortunately, right after launch, they realized that something was not going well with the mission and things was, were getting actually a little bit too hot. So they had to shut down some of the equipment on board because temperature was rising over 40 degrees Celsius. Now, on the approach to the moon, uh, the probe was still kind of spinning a little bit. So uh, earlier probes actually used these 
spin step stabilizers, which unfortunately I could not recreate here, but basically it would be two cables detached from both sides and at the end of those cables there would be some sort of a weight that would extend and similar to how a figure skater slow down their spin and their rotation by extending arms away from their bodies, this would also slow down the rotation of the craft and basically make it stop spinning. Or not stop spinning, but spin very, very, very slow instead. And this space probe passed only within about 6,200 kilometers from the moon near the south moon pole. So here on October 6, it flew past the pole and continued to the far side. And the, the really cool thing about this probe is that it had a very interesting design on how camera would be triggered. So it had a few photo cells which would be activated by the reflection of the light from the sunlit far side of the moon. So at this point, from our planet, the moon was completely dark. It didn't really show any sunlight, but the dark side of the moon, which is actually not the right way of calling it, it should really be called the far side of the moon because it's not really dark. It does get sunlight. So anyway, so that side was actually sunlit, and as soon as the probe detected that, it started its photography sequence and uh, oriented itself so that it could actually face the surface of the moon and started taking pictures. And the first picture was taken at a relatively far distance of about 64,000 kilometers. And it took about 29 pictures, and 18 of those pictures were later used for analysis and to make an atlas of the far side of the moon. And following the picture stage, it actually continued uh, flying past the north pole of the moon, and here here, this was actually when the first gravity assist was used and it was used quite successfully. Here's actually the picture of what it looked like. So as it passed behind the moon from south to north and headed back to Earth, the gravity assist from the moon changed the spacecraft's orbit. And now, interestingly, because of the change in its orbit, what it was supposed to do is actually fly very close to Earth over the research stations in Soviet Union, where it would then transmit back the data it received from the moon, specifically the pictures. And as the Soviet ground stations received those pictures, it would then possibly proceed back to the moon. And even though this was a relatively complex maneuver, uh, it, they've managed to receive all of the photographs by 18th of October, and by the time that the probe was really far away from the planet, they've received all of the data they wanted to get from it. And within four days, on October 22nd, they lost contact with the probe, and it was probably still in space for another year or so, and most likely burned up in Earth's atmosphere within a year afterwards. So it was basically in a very kind of elliptical orbit with its periapsis being relatively close to Earth's atmosphere and its apoapsis being really high up past the moon's orbit. But I guess we'll never really know what exactly happened to that probe because after uh, 1959 there was no more contact with it, so for all we know it might still be somewhere in space. And like so many other early Soviet probes, it was able to actually achieve quite a lot of new records. For example, there was a completely newly redesigned, really complex dual lens camera. They used a really awesome temperature and radiation resistant film for this camera. This was also the first uh, spacecraft to be stabilized on all three axes. So not just rotation, not just yaw or tilt, but actually all three axes were able to be stabilized so that the uh, spacecraft would be able to take uh, high quality pictures as it passed by the sur surface of the moon. And when it finished taking the photos, uh, all of the film was actually automatically moved to the onboard processor where all of the pictures were actually developed by the probe itself, fixed and dried automatically, and then all of the developed film would be sent to something called a flying spot scanner, which was sort of like a digital converter where basically all of the film was processed and the light was shown through it, and then this light would be converted to a signal that would then be transmitted to Earth, and this is how we received those photos and those pictures. Now, this wasn't a really digital, uh, this was still using analog video and analog transmission, but nevertheless this was quite an achievement because this was the first time Soviets were able to achieve something that complex. But we can't really give credits to Soviet for everything because ironically the film that they used in this camera, the temperature resistant and radiation hardened film, didn't come from the Soviets, it actually came from one of the American spy balloons, American genetics balloons, which were used to spy on the Soviets and on communist China, and the Soviets were able to recover one of the balloons and basically just took its tapes and all of its film and then used that on this mission, which is kind of ironic and probably was a way for the Soviets to really piss off the Americans. But overall, this was one of the few early missions that was actually almost completely successful, other than the fact that they started overheating a little bit, this was a mission that 
pretty much went as as it was supposed to with everything that the, the scientists planned for this mission being completely successful. So things like gravity assist, all of the photos and all of the transmission of the photos was absolutely successful, which was quite unusual for these early space probes that were used between 1958 and 1960. And because of its success, it even had its own little post stamp, which is what you see right here. This is a pretty interesting way of commemorating this trip and this success for the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, despite all of this success, the space race was far from over. The United States and the Soviet Union were still head to head trying to take the ultimate prize, which at this point was actually a manned mission to space and then a manned landing on the moon. And we'll talk about all of this in some of the future videos. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully you enjoyed this video about the history of spaceflight and Luna 3 mission. If you enjoyed it, check out some of the other videos and also subscribe to this channel, like this video and share it with your friends. Thank you so much for watching and game you later, bye bye.